where are you in the birth order of your family? Well, you might say, well, I'm an only child. Or you might say, man, I'm in a huge family. For me, I am the youngest of three. I have an older sister, and she and I have an older brother. Now, my older brother, to this day, is still my protector. But it was from him that I learned that he could also be a trickster. He might be the one that says, Donnie, try this. And I'd pop it in my mouth. And then he'd sit back and laugh as a jalapeno pepper caught fire in my mouth. So over time, I began to realize that every time he was like, hey, Donnie, try this. I'd be like, eh, I don't know. So then he added a tactic. He would say something like this. Don't you trust me? Or come on, you can believe me. And what I began to realize, and especially it expanded, when I gave my life to Christ, I began to study His Word and the study of Jesus Christ. Here's what I began to realize. This was a key component of the ministry of Jesus in discipling His followers. In essence, you won't do what you don't believe. If you flip that, you only actually believe something if it leads you to do something. It was Jesus' own brother that said, you do realize that faith without works is dead. So Jesus might say to his disciples, kind of in a confrontive way, where's your faith? Don't you believe? But then to those who were hurting, he would often say just this, do you believe me? Do you believe me? One example is in Matthew chapter 9, where Jesus meets these two blind men, and he asks them, do you believe I'm able to do this? And they both cry out, yes, and he heals them. But in another story, in Mark chapter 9, we meet a dad of a disabled son. And he wants his son to be healed, but his life has been so hard. And Jesus looks at him and asks him, do you believe? And the man says, I believe, but I need help to overcome my unbelief. So as we begin to understand what it means to be people that believe Jesus, take God at his word, trust in the promises of God, I think we're more like that father. But if we think about the history of faith, let's begin with, the father and the mother of the faithful, Abraham and Sarah. Aren't they faithful, but don't they need help overcoming their unbelief? Isn't this true down through history of Abraham with Isaac, Joseph in Egypt, Moses, Israel, the Red Sea, water from a rock, manna from heaven, protection and crossing the Jordan River? What about Rahab and Jericho? What about Joshua and Caleb? What about the stories of Gideon and Deborah? Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz? David facing Goliath, Elijah and Elisha? What about Daniel and his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? What about Esther? What about Joseph and Mary? All of these are in the hall of faith. These are the ones we lean into as our great cloud of witnesses. But what would they all say? I believe, but I need help with my unbelief. When you think back over the last few weeks, the last few days, the last 24 hours, the images of our country, the struggles that our country is going through, the writhing and the anguish, the protests and the frustration. Don't we sometimes wonder, God, where are you in this? Where are we headed? Where does this end? How do we, how do we find help? What's the answer? And God says, do you believe I can lead you through this? And we cry out trembling. I don't know. Or I believe, but I need help overcoming my unbelief. When I think about the way that people have been responding to the last several weeks or years or the last several days and hours, 
I see two main themes on social media and on the news. Different perspectives. Some people would say something like this, as a Minneapolis reporter said, the frustration you see is 400 years of frustration. Some say, no, it has nothing to do with slavery. It has nothing to do with the history of our nation. It's this unique circumstance. Well, how would we explore that? Well, I think it's important to note this. Slavery is not the result of racism. Policies that legalized, codified, and monetized human trafficking are not the result of racism. One of the most watershed moments of my life in the last four years, is reading the book Stamped from the Beginning by Ibram Kendi. He revealed something to me that I did not know before. He articulated through a meticulous, detailed history that slavery is the result of self-interest. That over the course of the centuries, you didn't need racism to convince people to traffic in humans as a component of agricultural and industrial mechanisms. That has been a part of history for millennia. Slavery did not depend on racism. But when this nation was founded, other nations from which immigrants to this country came, had already begun to encounter the moral dilemma of slavery. Some nations were already outlawing it, but not us. So the question was, how do you validate a practice that others condemn? How do you validate a practice if you're a Christian that you cannot justify by the Christ. And that's where racism does its dirty work. Because racism begins to function as a systematic way to make us feel better about ourselves. Kendi notes that racism is a way to assuage the guilt of continuing in a practice that you know is morally wrong. So racism begins to function in such a way that it says, no, it's actually not morally wrong because everything you are doing is morally right. Racism bifurcates people. It splits them apart. It suggests that there's one kind of people and another kind of people, a kind that is more deserving, and that the things they do are right. The things they do were wrapped around charged words like civilized. But the things that other people do, their practices, their cultures, put them in a position where they are less than, and in the history of this nation and others, less than human. So now, the practices that would not match the life of Christ, the teachings of Christ, the following of Christ, can now be justified by racism. So what racism began to do was protect the legalization and the monetization of trafficking in humans for agricultural and industrial production. In essence, racism protects self-interest. That being the case, we begin to realize then that racism isn't first and foremost about having a hateful spirit or a hateful intent. Racism is the participation in a reconfiguring 
of a social and moral structure that says some people are superior and some people are inferior and those that believe themselves to be superior and are in power determine the nature of the social structure which allows them to put other people and hold other people in an inferior and an unequal position. If self-interest is the root of slavery and racism protects self-interest, then we might find it surprising that the most anti-racist scripture in all the Bible would be Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Would you please turn in your Bible to Philippians 2, 1 through 4. Let's read together. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Holy Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. You see, in opposition to self-interest is our life in Christ. If self-interest is the factor in human trafficking, the factor in slavery, and that racism is necessary to allow us to continue practices that put other people in an inequitable and inferior position, then when we follow Christ and abandon self-interest, it immediately puts us on the front line of rising up and destroying everything that has to do with protecting our self-interests. Which means that racism is now no longer just kind of a word or a concept to be batted around, something to consider uh, politically. Racism is an enemy. It is an enemy to the life of Christ. And the racism that is necessary to protect self-interest, if we are no longer living into Satan's social structure, the structure of self-interest, then we no longer need racism to protect His structure. We're living into the structure of Christ, the social life that Christ inaugurated in His his body on the cross when He on the cross birthed one new humanity. So in the birthing of one new humanity, where because of the Holy Spirit within us, we have the same love for each other, the same mind for each other, we value each other above ourselves, and we look not to our own interests but to the interests of others. When we live like that, racism is obsolete and needs to be destroyed. So Philippians 2, 1 through 4 becomes the most anti-racist scripture in the Bible. But Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, gives us the most anti-racist example in history. Read it with me. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not regard equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. God in the flesh did not force humanity to take from him the advantage of equality with deity. He gave it up on his own. He emptied himself. He humbled himself. 
It was Jesus who, because he was determined to take up our cause, joined us in our circumstances. He didn't ask humanity to fight him in order to join us. We didn't have to conquer him in order to join us. He gave it up on his own and joined us in our circumstances. He is the most anti-racist example in all world history. But then that would mean that the most anti-racist strategy in the social, communal, psychological, and relational theory in history is Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. God gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You see, it is God who exalts. Not one human other another human, but God who working in us exalts humanity to be restored to His image. It is God who names. It's God who names His people. It's God who includes. It's God who calls His people to His heart and says, everyone my heart hurts for should hurt your heart. Everyone who is suffering for whom I have compassion, it should generate the same divine compassion in your heart. No one stands if Jesus kneels. And all kneel when Jesus stands. The world, led by the church, is one citizenship with one Lord, one master, one president, one premier, one king. We have one who is over all, Jesus Christ. And all of this is not to the glory of one group over another. It is all to the glory of God. So the strategy that we are given is that in Christ, we would look not to our own interests, which would generate racism in all its nefarious forms to protect our self-interest. But now racism becomes an enemy, and the church leading a tsunami of protest says, we will rise up in the name of Christ as one body worldwide under one Lord, filled by one Spirit, led by one God, and we will destroy racism in all of its nefarious forms because it is no longer needed in our lives because we do not want anything to protect our self-interest. That's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ transforming our lives. You say, well, that is a dangerous enterprise. You are correct. The Apostle Paul knew this. You see, the Apostle Paul's voice had been compromised by his persecution of the church. He himself says in 1 Timothy that I was once a violent man myself. I was the oppressor. I was the persecutor. But I met Jesus Christ. And who I am today is because of Him and His role in my life. Jesus led me out of that life. And Jesus redeemed my voice. Here is the truth, brothers and sisters. The voice of America has been compromised from the beginning because other nations could not hear our call for freedom when they saw our systemic self-interest. When they recognized that in our self-interest we would traffic in humanity and that we would grind other humans under the sledge of our agricultural and industrial production, they looked at us and pointed out our hypocrisy and our inconsistencies. If you read in the history of the propaganda of the Nazi war machine or the Soviet war machine, they both, both cite 
our history of inequity and racism and slavery as the failure of freedom and democracy. Both of them. And this has been true of the church. Our voice was compromised because the church was complicit in all of that self-interest, all of that racism, all of the policy making that built into the fabric of our nation that inequity. But we, like Paul, can be redeemed. We can be restored. We can become courageous. But how? Well, Scripture teaches us. Scripture teaches us to empty ourselves. To realize, I'm not it. I don't have it all together. I am not better than anyone. The spirit of supremacy, specifically in this nation, white supremacy, is killing us because it continues to sow sow the poison of arrogance into our soil. Second, Stop chiseling negative narratives about others into the bedrock of your own personhood. When you believe your stories about others, you will tell them to others. What you cryptically say about others in innuendo and what you insinuate serves to insulate you from scrutiny of your own inconsistencies and faults. We must empty ourselves But how? Well, this text tells us that we must be emptied and filled with the Spirit. How do we get there? It means that when we are emptied, that we cannot empty ourselves. I'm too full of myself, I'm too full of my sin. Consciously or unconsciously. The only way for Don McLaughlin to be emptied of what offends God is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. As the Spirit fills me, He, in essence, flushes out of me the uncleanness of my motives and my thoughts. How do we be filled with the Holy Spirit? Scripture says, That when you repent and you're baptized into Christ, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. But even for those who have already confessed Christ, already been baptized, Scripture says, be filled with the Spirit. It has to be ongoing. In our discipleship pathway in this church, what we say is this, it is the direction you're headed that marks what you believe. It's not that we're already there, that we've already accomplished it. But if we do what we believe, then the direction we choose is what indicates what we truly believe. So first, we pray. We bring a posture of humility to prayer because whatever posture you you bring to to prayer will determine the position of your mind when you leave prayer. If you bring a posture of humility, then you will leave prayer an anti-racist ever increasingly. Every time you put yourself in a posture of humility before Jesus, the Holy Spirit will flush out more and more racism out of your system, out of my system. We fix our eyes on Jesus. Jesus will never lead us into more racism. He will always lead us away from racism, because racism is only necessary when we want to protect self-interest. We ask the Spirit to fill us. The Spirit will never fill us with racism. The Spirit will never allow us to keep any racism in us. We will always have more and more transformation to be anti-racist because of the Spirit at work within us. Ask God to recreate you anew. God in creation and recreation will never recreate in us self-interest or the racism necessary to protect self-interest. God will always recreate us to be to care about the interests of others and for that reason to cleanse us from racism. Now what's the benefit of all of that? That I will be filled with the example of Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the newness of God. 
And then, like the Apostle Paul, we can live bravely in this world. We can stand with the oppressed. We can take the hits for the oppressed. We can walk with, kneel with, work with to end racism because we have determined to give up our self-interests. But that requires bravery. And that bravery only comes from God. So today I'm asking you to leave, lean, lean into prayer, the example of Christ, the filling of the Spirit, and the recreation of God. Because the more we're filled with the Spirit of God, the more fearless we will be. We will live to our fullest when we are willing to be emptied. So where do we go from here? What steps do we take forward? We've articulated these four steps, but some might be saying, well, then how do I take one of those first steps? How do I say to God, I need less of me and I need you? How do I step into faith for the first time to be filled with the Holy Spirit? What I'm asking you to do right now, if you're watching this live, is just go over to that chat box and see that button that says next steps. If you're not watching it live, go to lovefirst.org. Scroll down to that bar that says next steps and reach out and say to someone, I just need someone to walk with me and take these steps of faith. But you might say, I've taken that step, but now I realize that there's some things in me that need to be flushed out, emptied out. I need to be able to say, Holy Spirit, fill me. And you too may be saying, I need someone to walk with me in that. Well, that next step of faith is for you as well. But you might also be saying, I need resources. You've mentioned your own journey. I mentioned to you some of the myths I've had to overcome, some of the misconceptions, some of the watershed moments for me just in the last few years. And you might be saying, I need some of those resources. So you'll also notice in the chat box is a button that says resources. Click on that because there are opportunities waiting for you to join this journey. And what I'm asking you to do is just take one step today, whether it's a fresh step of faith, a new step of faith, or a step deeper into your faith. But let's take that step together today.